Thank you for tuning in to J.C. Matthews Ministries. We are committed to teaching the concepts, laws, and principles of God's kingdom, empowering you to discover your true identity and purpose in life. Grab your Bible and pad as you join the message. Okay, I want to thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, what I want to do is continue in our series that we began a couple weeks ago. Um, the title of the overall series is The Perfecting or the Maturing of the Saints. Now, this is part four. We just left uh, a portion of this particular series on judging. And what I want to do now is move to another topic that I think is just as important. Um, this speaks directly to our identity. And so what I want to do is to talk to you about the the reality and the responsibility of growing in godliness. And what I want to do is um, we're still going to use our foundational scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And again, I, um, I will be reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible uh, for that particular text. And then I want to jump to our second scripture that we want to focus on, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. So our foundational scripture for our series is Ephesians chapter 4. And in particular, we're going to focus on verses 11 and 12, reading from the New Living Translation. And then the focus of today's uh, scripture, or today's uh, focus scripture, if that's, the, if that's the way you want to qualify it, it is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Now, I'm going to read that in the King James Version. So Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, it reads as follows. It says, now these, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his or God's work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So as we spoke in previous lessons, we noted that the purpose of the fivefold ministry gifts is to grow the people of God not just in knowledge, but grow them to the place where they can actually engage in what the scripture calls, or the text calls, the work of God. Now that's important because uh, one of the things we, if you've been a uh, member of this ministry or if you follow kingdom teaching, one of the things that should jump out at you when you are studying the kingdom is that God intended for his kingdom to be operated as a partnership in the sense in this sense that as it relates to this world he gave man dominion That's right. dominion is absolute authority so god delegated his authority over his property to his sons that he intended to partner with in running the kingdom so that means that that partnership, God primarily, um, that partnership to understand stand it properly, God has all power. He retained all power. That is the ability to do a thing. But he has delegated his authority to those who are family. And that authority is the legal right to do a thing. So thus we have the saying, without God, man cannot, and without man, God will not. Without God, man can't do anything. But without man, God won't do anything in the earth. Why? Because he has delegated the earth or the authority of the affairs of men and the earth to men, specifically those who are family members. So if God wants to do anything in the earth, he's going to do it through what? Somebody who has submitted to him. So God's going to use a human being. I'm talking about particularly in the kingdom. God can use pagans as well. Uh, but I'm talking about in the kingdom. He's going to find somebody 
to do it through. So if he wants to do work in advancing his kingdom in this world, he's got to find somebody in the kingdom that will partner with him to do it. So that individual for, for all legitimate purpose is engaged in God's work. All right. Second Peter chapter one, verses two through four. Again, I'm going to read this uh, text from the King James version. And it says this grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and there's the word godliness. So God has given us everything. Now, now, now pay attention to what the text says. God has given us everything that's necessary for life. So if you have a need to sustain life or to to live life just in, in, in a general sense. God has provided that. But then he goes on, he says, and godliness. Watch this. Through the knowledge of him, who's Jesus. So this godliness is found in the knowledge of the one who God sent as a representation or a representative of, of, of man, of all men, corporate man, the first, the original kind of man. So Jesus was the second Adam. He came to do what the first Adam failed to do. And he came to demonstrate or to model for us what that kind of man looks like living here on earth. Walking by faith, subduing and having dominion over creation in, in over the earth. So the scripture is saying that we have to have the knowledge of him. Of how he lived, not only who he was, but how he lived. That's, right. That's what we find primarily in the Gospels, how he lived that have called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be, here it is, partakers or participants of the divine nature. Now let's look at this again because this is trying to tell us something that goes beyond our understanding or our contemporary concept of what godliness means. This is something that has to be restored to our consciousness. We have to be educated on what it means to be godly. Because I'm going to suggest that what is intended scripturally in regards to what it means to be godly involves much more than just being a nice person. All right. Um, it, it, it involves much more than just having being in, being endowed with the uh, spiritual gifts or fruits. Because he's saying here that this will require your knowledge of God and Jesus. Yes. Specifically, it then points out through the knowledge of Jesus that we have been called to this glory and this virtue. Then he goes on verse number four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great precious promises. Those promises are to sustain us that by these we might be partakers or participants of divine nature, of divine nature. What I want to do is I want to provide a scriptural basis for some things that I think without taking this approach is going to be difficult for us to be able to really understand and embrace what it is that God is saying here through the writer, because our our concept of what it means to be uh, born again and 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 uh, uh, members of the church and sons of God has has been so compromised yes. and, and so and so managed down that there's really no distinction, difference, or even expectation of there being a greater reality in life 
that we are to strive daily to obtain that transcends natural human abilities and limitations and lifestyle. That sounds radical to a lot of people because this is not something that is taught. We are taught to expect that type of life when we die right. and go to heaven and live and, and leave here. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we got to die in this world to actually experience life. Jesus says, I came to give you life and that you might have life much more abundantly. He's given us all these spiritual provisions. This is a... This is a revelation of the kingdom that has to be understood. Every spiritual provision that God gives you while you're here on earth is for here. That's right. Every supernatural endowment, every fruit, every spiritual gift, every spiritual ability is not for you to take with you and go to heaven. That's right. It is to be exercised and manifested here on earth. So we have to recognize that the things that God has given us are supernatural, the spiritual. Therefore, he intends and expects for us to, in that vein, operate in the supernatural. Employing these things, these, these gifts, these fruits, they distinguish us from other people. Say that. Listen, to, uh, and, and I'm going to get to this in our lesson. Listen to how Jesus talks. When he's talking to his disciples, he sends them out and he says, listen, heal the sick. If necessary, raise the dead. Look, watch, watch this. If you're sent, don't worry about poison entering into your body and causing you to have to abort your mission. He said, you could be bitten by a serpent. He goes on. He's a drinking deadly things. He goes on and he says, listen, if you find someone who is demonically oppressed, cast the devil out. That's right. He's talking to men. He was talking to people who had connected themselves to the kingdom. Yes. And he was trying to demonstrate or get them to imitate what he was doing. Yes. The purpose of that is Jesus saying, listen, don't confine that kind of operation just to me. I'm a that's man. Right, that's right. I didn't come as God. I came as a man. I humbled myself. And I, I released certain rights that I have as God so I could operate wholly as a man. So that I could understand your weaknesses. So I can understand what it feels like to fear. So I can understand what it feels like to get hungry. So I can understand what it feels like to get angry. I had to, I had to release divine privilege. So that I can participate in humanity. In its totality. So that when I send you out. I understand the only issue is whether or not you believe. That's right. That's right. What you've been told. This is why godliness has to be taught in such a way that after you are born again, this word has to be introduced to people. Yes. Now watch how I say it. Godliness is a construct. It's a construction. It's a word that is comprised of two words. God likeness. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's a truncation. God likeness is godliness. So I, I want you to start doing this. When you read the word godliness, I want you to say God likeness. All right. To start getting this in your mind. This word has to be introduced to you after you get saved. As you are being taught and being established in your foundation, we ought to be teaching people it is your responsibility to grow in your God likeness. Yes, that's right. Ooh, that's too much for some people right there. Some people checked out right there because they're thinking, how in the world are you saying that uh, we're supposed to be like God? Well, I'm not saying that the Bible says yes, you are. Yes, that's right. Unless you're taught that, see, that, uh, that's the problem. Yes. You won't think like that. That's right. And if you don't think like that, then you can't realize what the scripture says you are responsible for and able to do. That's right. 
Your expectations won't change. Your expectations will be on the other side of this life. I got saved so that I won't go to hell, so that I will go to heaven. And that concept, when we look at scripture, is, is that heaven comes to earth. That's right. You're going to end up back here. Yes. So we, 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 have to, we have to start to cultivate a consciousness in the mind of people that they think properly. That's why I said we need to, when, when people get born again, we need to establish them in the doctrine. But as we are establishing them in the doctrinal foundation, we need to be establishing them in their identity foundation. That's right. That's right. It'd be, it, it, it would have been quite a different scene if the church would have been established in its identity and God likeness. Say that. And let something like COVID show up. Yes. Gods don't fear COVID. Say that. Say that. Gods don't fear lack. Gods don't fear disease. Mm -hmm. Watch this. Gods don't fear devils. That's right. They cast them out. That's right. Gods don't fear lack. They multiply provision. Gods don't fear disease. They heal it. Yes. Gods don't run from a disease. People run to the gods with diseases. Mm -hmm. See, this is too much. But this is what we see in scripture. Yes. Either we believe this or we don't. We need to shut down Say that. every microphone, every platform. That is teaching something other than what we see in scripture. Yes. But this takes a mindset. This is why the kingdom is the end time doctrine. Yes. This is why Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom must be preached. Not salvation. That's right. Because salvation has been preached all around the world. Faith. You're going to need faith. Miracle signs and wonders, grace, all of those are necessary messages, but they all find their purpose in the kingdom. Yes, that's right. You, you need to understand grace to get in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. You need to be saved to get in the kingdom. You need faith to get in the kingdom. Then once you're in the kingdom, you have to understand how they now are provisions for you to operate in the kingdom. But what's the common denominator? What, uh, what, what, what is the context in which all of these things find the, the, the kingdom? So Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom, in which you'll find salvation, faith, grace, miracle signs, and wonders. Yes. But the kingdom must be preached to all the world yes. as a witness. And then only the end can come. Why? Because that's what it's all about. They got to know what it is that either they're going to accept or they're going to reject. And the kingdom comes with evidence as a witness. Yes, it does. These aren't just people just preaching and talking and rehearsing and, and, and a reciting scripture. They're saying what the Bible says. The people are seeing what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Evidence. It's, but this has to be a mindset that is restored. This is not something that you just get born again and get. That's right. You have the potential that is inherent. We're going to talk about that. But it has to be grown or matured. Yes. You have to be made aware of, listen, last week you were spiritually dead. And you, and you, and you were a citizen of another kingdom. Mm -hmm. You had a lord, a different lord. You got born again and now some things have been restored to you. That were lost. Yes. Now you have the potential that was given to the original man. Yes. You have a likeness now that causes you to transcend natural limitations. You don't have to fear when everybody else is fear. That's right. Is, 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 is under fear. You don't have to be in despair when you don't have enough. That's right. I'm trying to train your mind to think properly. You don't have to. Um, you don't have to concede to somebody for something. That's 
That's right. Why? Because you have a kingdom that you're part of that has resources that is the resource. Yes. No, it, it is the source of every resource. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. This is why we need to have our minds changed. The Bible talks about, the Bible says this. He says that um, you need to grow in the knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says we've been given all things for life and God likeness. See there? And through that God likeness comes through the knowledge of him because Jesus was God in the flesh. He, 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 he was as much the image and likeness as you're going to see. We have the recording of his life so that we can see what God likeness looks living on earth. So we got to study him to know what God likeness looks like. And then it goes on, he says, so that you can be partakers, not only see it, but so that you can participate in it. Yes. In divine nature. Now, in order to understand this, our mind has to be transformed. I'm going to give you some scriptures that, that will help you not only conceptualize, but to internalize and receive this revelation of you being God-like in your God-likeness. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. This is King James Version of the Bible. says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, robbery to be equal with God. Now, that's where we have a problem. Because when, when we hear the word equal in the English ear, we, we consider it to be, to be equivalent in worth or value. Or, or uh, just as important, equal. That's not what it means. This word equal means to be of like kind. Yes. To be equal with God, I want you to understand or hear with your ear like kind. Like kind. Now watch this. We have scripture that proves this. John chapter 5, uh, verses 17 through 18. Watch this. But Jesus answered them. They, they were about to stone Jesus. And Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now. And I have been working. And verse 18 says, therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him. Because not only did he break the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father. Watch this. Making him equal with God. So they understood. What did I say that uh, equal meant of like kind? Mm -hmm. Same class. Mm -hmm. They said blasphemy. Because he said, God is my father. They said, wait one minute. Let's read it again. Verse number, verse number 18. He says, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. They said that's blasphemy. Now, we should have a problem with that because Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, this is how you pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So Jesus is directing you when you pray to call God your Father. Yes. John just told us that the that that the people understood that when you say something is your father, you're saying you're of the like kind. Yes. And they were looking at him and saying, no, you're a man. Jesus was saying, wait a minute now, there's a transition that has taken place. A son of God who also is a man does not, that does not diminish his likeness to God. That's right. That's right. I'm going to say it again. I was trying to get, I was trying to, trying to articulate what I see. Your being a human being does not diminish the relationship God has established yes. for you in the earth. Yes. But you got to be taught this because you're not going to look different from people. That's right. Outside of your t-shirts and, and the crosses and stuff that even pagans and heathens wear crosses now. Mm -hmm. But I... I Outside of what, what, what you put on, which doesn't matter, 
we don't look differently. And I got born again, I didn't grow a couple inches. That's right. My face didn't glow. So now, you know, Christians walk in a place, oh, he's a Christian because he got a halo or he's glowing. No, you look the same. Yes. But you are, in fact, different. Mm -hmm. You have been made a like kind now. And that like kind is a likeness now to God. Therefore, there's an expectation to grow in God likeness. Yes. Because you have become family to God. That's right. He's your father. And the world will look at that and say blasphemy. Because if he's your father, then that God, that has to, you have to be a God. All right, let's, let's, take, let's take a look to see if that's the case. John chapter 10, verses 31 through 36. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So, so they are adamant to stone Jesus. Yeah. Because he is demonstrating something to the people that they can't control. Say that. He, he's, he's living in such a way and operating in, <coughs> in such a power that if they disagree with what he says, they can't refute what they see. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Just like when they brought him in and they said, how did this man walk? And Jesus didn't even have to be there to speak for himself. The man says, all I know is... I once was blind, but now I see. Whatever you say about him, whatever you think about him, that's your business. But what you see before you, how do you explain that? All right. And they st they'll go they'll go back and try to figure out out a way to trap him because the evidence was overwhelming. Yes. And so here you have Jesus. They're trying to stone him again for what? Blasphemy. Uh, uh, what did he say? Well, let's let's keep let's keep reading. Verse number thirty-one. Then Jews. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Uh, verse 30, 32. Jesus answered them, "Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me?" Now he called God his Father again. Verse number thirty-three. Jews answered, saying, "For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy." Now what? Why? What did I say that was blasphemy? Because you being a man, make yourself God. How did he do that? He called God his father. Yes. Now watch what Jesus does to correct this. Verse number 34. Jesus answered them and said, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came. So that the teaching that I've done before. That when God gives somebody his word that is in covenant with him and God sends them, they become God to whomever God sent the person yes. to speak to. Yes. So when that person is uh, sent and the person receives them, they're not receiving the person, they're receiving God. That's right. Whatever that person says, that person better, the, the person being spoken to better understand that he's not speaking to that man. So Jesus is saying here, in, in, in this context, he's talking about those he had established as judges in, in uh, Psalms chapter 82. But he says, when God gives you his word, and God trusts his word to his people, when God gave you his word, you cease necessarily being like everybody else. That's right. You became God's. Now watch this, verse 34. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, he said, and it's true today. Yes. Do you say of him whom the father sanctified, here it is, and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because this is what he said, because I said, I'm the son of God. Psalms 82, verse six and seven that I was referencing, I said, you are gods and all of you are the children of the most high. So he's saying that you're gods because you're children of the most high. You're sons of God. Now, that's what they said that Jesus blasphemed about. Now, if we look at Galatians chapter 3, verse number 26, Paul says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So there had to be some progression of thought from the gospels to now the church being uh, being established where they 
heard somebody say, God, uh, God is my father. You're blaspheming. Because they had never, from, from Adam to Jesus, yeah. that kind of man had not been in the earth. That's right. Um, there was no literal sons of God because all men were spiritually dead. God had to legally qualify them as sons until they could literally be born again and become sons. And so Jesus enters the scene as the son of God, as that paradigm for us to see and witness how a son of God, who's also a human being who lives by faith or walks by faith, subduing and having dominion in the earth until that man showed up again, there was no record of that type of man. So now that he's back, Jesus is trying to demonstrate to these people, this is what God intended for men to be. Yes. Not only that, as a son of God, I bear a likeness to God. At that time that Jesus was speaking that in the Gospels, their ears could not receive it. All right. They were like, this man is blaspheming. But then we see in the epistles, it's accepted. As a matter of fact, you don't find the word godliness until you get to the New Testament. Because that's where it was restored. God likeness was restored. Yes. If, if, if you're looking at a King James Bible. So there's something that had been taught from Jesus ministry on that transformed the mind of the early church, the first church. They started to see themselves in a way that was considered blasphemy under the old paradigm. Right. This is what I'm trying to say. Unless you have a kingdom paradigm, Yes. Religion will hear you hear you talk like we're talking today and say it's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. No, it's kingdom. Yes, that's right. We're not we're not members of a religion. We are, we have become members of a family. Yes. Religion is based on what we believe. Mm -hmm. Family is based on who we become. I've been born from a father and therefore I have to be like my father. Yes. And there does no violence to the majesty or the honor of my father to call him the, my father. It compromises him not one iota. That's right. By me saying, when my son says, my name is J.C. Matthews, he has the same initials that I do. I've seen on some posts, people are kind of confused. Which, which J.C. you talking about? I don't get offended. Mm -hmm. okay. It takes nothing from me when they say J.C. Matthews and they're not talking about me. They're talking about my son. Mm -hmm. what, what, what my son is really doing is he's identifying with his source. Yes. Matter of fact, people say, when I see him, I see you. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not challenged or that doesn't threaten my position as father. Mm -hmm. It's an honor. Yes. That's a kingdom mindset. So when you say God is my father or I'm the I'm a son of God or I'm operating in God likeness, a religious mind will get offended. Mm -hmm. A kingdom mind will say that's proper. Yes. Cuz you can't be nothing other than. Let let's take let's take a look at um the concept of divine nature I, because I want to get through uh, what understand divine nature, having an understanding of divine nature. And also I want to get through the law of like kind. And then I want to show you how Jesus actually taught his disciples to operate in this capacity. So when you're talking about godliness, you're talking about, uh, the Bible says divine nature, divine nature. And what it's really talking about is God's nature. God's nature. Now that word nature that we see there used, it is the word phusis. Now watch this. The divine nature or the nature that is talking about phusis, watch this. Because it's saying, it, 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 it said in the text, it says that we are to be partakers of this divine nature. 
Well, the word fusis means growth. Growth. It goes on to explain lineal descent. You know what lineal descent is this? JC, well, my, my father's Henry Matthews. I'm JC Matthews. My son is JC Matthews. His son is Maximus Matthews. That's lineal descent. That 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 means that what came from what what we came from we're like. There's 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 no break in between there where somebody had a chimpanzee or a pig or anything along that because like kind produces like kind. And so by that being included in the definition of nature, which the first definition is growth, we have to grow like what we came from. Yes. Say that's natural. That's natural. It goes on, it says native disposition or constitution or kind. There's that word again. Or kind. So when it's talking about nature, it's talking about all those things. Growth, being like what you have been um, birthed from, your constitution, and your kind. This is what you're supposed to grow in. He said divine nature. So you're supposed to grow in your likeness or kind of God. Did I say that right? Did you understand what I said? Mm -hmm. So the 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 fo the foundation of that is if the, there, there's actually a root word, the root word of uh of fusis is fuo. Fuo actually means to grow or to spring from. Mm -hmm. So this nature that we're supposed to be growing in is characterized as divine nature, or God's nature. Now, how is that possible? Well, if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, what you'll find in Genesis chapter 1 is what I call the law of like kind. And, and the reason why I present it in this fashion is so that you can, you can follow the logic before we come to the conclusion. Because the conclusion can be hard for some people. Unless you... Unless you Establish this, this this basis. So what we find uh, the law of like kind simply in Genesis is this: whatever the parent or originator could do, the offspring, in a like manner, has the inherent ability to do. I said inherent ability. You don't need nothing else, but to mature. Watch this. This is why it talks about growing. In godliness it talks about us, us growing in the divine the word nature there means to grow into this is why it, it talks about growth because a a a baby cheetah cub can't run 60 miles an hour All right. but his parent could yes listen if we put that cheetah that grew up physically and we put it next to a dog and they said, go. And the dog beat the cheetah every time. We would say, something's wrong. Yes. Say that. We, we would say, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. The cheetah would say, I'm doing the best I can. We would say, no, we know you got more. Say that. Why? Because your parents yes. can run, all of them can run 60 miles an hour. Yes. None of them will lose to this dog. Yes. There's something wrong with your understanding yes. or, or there, 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 there is something that is blocking you from accessing the potential and the ability that you have. A bird. I, let, let, I'm, I'm going to show you this in scripture. An eagle. Mm -hmm. If we find a bald eagle with seven foot wingspan walking along the yard with chickens, mm -hmm. you would do a double take. And we said, what you doing, Eagle? He's like, oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking for something to eat. Well, why aren't you out soaring around? I can't do that. They would say, yes, you can. 
And what that eagle would, would would need, there's actually an actual story that goes along with that. That eagle would need to see another eagle doing it. Yes. So that he would know, he would look at himself, look at that bird and say, I'm like that kind. Yes. Not like this kind. That's right. That's right. Listen to me. I'm trying to show you this is why Jesus came to show us that kind. Because we had eagles, we have born, we have born again believers who are walking around in the chicken yard of the world. And Jesus came along and said, Hey, eagles, let me show you how you're supposed to live. That's right. That's right. Now we have the ability to look around and say, Oh, we ain't like these. The rest of everybody else. We're like that. Yes. And what he can do. We can do. That's right. This is how I want you to see the Gospels. Now, this principle that I gave you is actually listed in Genesis chapter 1, and I want to show you it. The law of like kind, again, whatever the parent or originator can do, the offspring can inherently do in like manner. So in Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, now it's talking about plant life. This is the law of like kind. I just, I just repeated it to you. It says, in verse number 11, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit uh, trees yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So what that scripture is telling you is, is that the fruit tree that produces fruit that has a seed in it will produce like kind of fruit. So those seeds, if you put it in the ground, you're going to get what, what produced it. That's right. If it's an orange tree, you put that seed, that orange seed in the ground and it produces an orange tree, not an apple tree. That's right. If you want apples, you got to get an apple tree of that kind. So it's telling us after it's kind, after it's kind. So he says that's a law even in plant life. Yes. Now, go to verse number 21, Genesis chapter 1, verse 21. Marine and fowl life, a bird life. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, that moveth which, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So if the fish had a fish, the fish that was born will be able to do what the fish that gave birth to it was able to do. If the fowl or the bird that had a chick, that, that chick will be able to do whatever the birthing bird could do after its kind. Do we understand that? Yes. So we don't have no problem with that. As a matter of fact, if somebody were to tell us something other than that, we would think there was something wrong with them. Let's go down to verse number 24 and 25. Land moving creatures. So we, we've seen plant life. We've seen things that move in the water. We see things that move, that, that fly above the earth. Now we're seeing um, things that move upon the, uh, upon the land. If we find that same paradigm here, then it's a law. So he says, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that, that creep upon the earth after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Again, <laughs> scripture is trying to tell you if the thing creep, what comes after it's going to creep. If the thing moved upon the, the four or four legs, it's going to move upon the earth on four legs after its kind. We have no, we've seen it with plant life. We've seen it with fish. We've seen it with birds. Now we've seen it with land moving animals. Now we go to verse number 26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Say like kind. Like kind. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Now watch this. Why would man have dominion? Because God has dominion. Yes. I'm giving him the ability to act like 
me because he is from me. The law of like kind. Therefore, when we get born again, we now have the ability to be God-like. Yes. Godliness is God-likeness. We find it all through the New Testament. We're supposed to exercise godliness, walk in godliness, grow in godliness. Bible talks about even there's a mystery of godliness. Why is it a mystery? Why? Because it wasn't possible before. God operating and being in a man. That man actually being able to say, God is my father. I am a son of God. Religion, blasphemy, kingdom, family. This is something that we need to understand. So now... What we find in the Gospels is this. Here's Jesus now. Jesus is saying, hey, everybody. I have, I've, I have come, my primary mission in this world is to do what? To restore. I am to redeem men. I am to... I, I am to restore a paradigm in a relationship that God lost with man. I am to to have or, or, or to make possible uh, for men to be reborn, redeemed. Um, whenever you want to think about what Jesus has done, all you put is the prefix re before it. And you get an idea that he's pointing back to something. He is bringing forward something that had already been. Understand when you say refill my glass, we understand your glass is what's filled. You're saying bringing it back to a former state of, 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 of being. This is what Jesus did. Jesus came to show us what, what we were supposed to be from, from the beginning. Yes. And then live the life that Adam was supposed to be able to live. And then turn that same life over to us and saying, greater works you will do because I go to the Father. I've created a body. You're members of the body. You do what I would do if I was there to do it. What? What? Watch this. That's that's growing in God likeness. There, there is not, there's nothing wrong with us being able to say, um, after you're born again, that I am in the likeness of God. Yes. Not, like I said, this should be the first thing that's being taught. Not that yes. I'm a member of X, Y, and Z church or denomination. That's right. That's right. That's right. People will people will confess to that before they will say, I'm yes. a son of God. Say that. Or that I'm operating in God likeness. L listen to me. What does that mean today? We we have so we're so afraid of engaging our identity in the church, and I and I believe that is demonic yes. in a lot of places. That there's such a fight to cause people to to gravitate to the lowest denominator of what it call what what can be called Christian. Say that the lowest denominator. And then we reinforce that in doctrine and cause babies to believe that they're mature simply because they can recite a memory verse. Say that. When the reality that has been exposed to us is so big and, and, and so powerful that it takes a transformed mind to be able to engage it. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to, to lose uh, uh, to to release and relinquish your your allegiance to logic. Yes. To operate in the realm of faith. Yes. This is what Jesus was teaching them. Mm -hmm. hey, listen, I don't care if it logically don't make sense. That's right. Be, watch this, because you're not dealing with facts. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with truth and authority. Yes. Understand what I just said. You're not confined to or determined by facts. That's right. 
Your reality is shaped by truth and authority. That's right. God could look at a situation. This is why your, your, your mind has to be flexible. I believe this is why Jesus said to operate in the living the kingdom, you got to be like a baby. You got to be like a child because you have to be able to believe some things just because it was said. That's right. He said, a child, you can tell a child anything, a child will go, okay. Daddy said it, okay, it's true. That's right, that's right. If Listen, if daddy said to a child, it, it's raining outside, and that child's mind hasn't been uh, corrupted, it has learned to trust what his father says. His father said, going outside and play is, is sunny out. He might step out there and see the rain and turn around and look. His father said, go, go, it's sunny. A child would do that. He said, your, your, your mind has to be so malleable All right. that when you hear the word of God from your yes, father, yes, yes, yes. that it don't matter what you see. Yes. It just became what he said. Yes. I told you this uh, before. The church has to get to the mindset again where if we sat down and met on Sunday, and if God cracked open the sky and said it's now Tuesday, we all better jump up and put on our work clothes mm -hmm. and get ready to go to work right there because it just became Tuesday. That's right. That, that mindset has to be restored. That has to be taught. And if it's not taught, what happens is we get born again, but we have the same mind. Yes. Our... our, our, our um, our reality doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Our expectations That's don't right. change. That's right. Our, our mode of operation don't change. Mm -hmm. That's why we can respond the same way to the pandemic and everything as the world did. There wasn't no, right. there wasn't no difference. All right. And I'm saying it. I'm saying it. I'm saying it out loud. Yes. And you have people that will argue with me. Well, you need to be careful. You need to be cautious. Show me that in the scripture. Show me, show me, show me where, where somebody who, who had, where Jesus was sending people yes. out. He said, if you came in contact with somebody, you heal them. Yes. As a matter of fact, the people who were sick came to the church. Yes. The Bible says this, he healed all manner of diseases. Don't matter what they had. That's right. Jesus gave them power. He said, I give you, I, I give you power over all sickness. Somebody come in and say, but I got COVID. We go, oh, shut the whole, shut the whole thing down. No, in 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 the text and what we read about the New Testament church, that would not have been a reality. All right, let me do, let me do this. So we understand that we have been given this image and likeness of God. That is God that gives us the ability to operate in godliness or God likeness. We see that in Genesis chapter one, verse number 26. In Genesis chapter one, um, we also see the law of like kind where we see the progression where God has established that if you, per, if, if you proceed from something, you are like it. Therefore, Jesus had no problem with saying, I'm the son of God. And the people understanding that by him calling God his father, him saying he is son, they said, you, you're trying to be equal with God. Mm -hmm. We understand that the word equal actually means to be like, yes. of similar kind. Yes. Therefore, he didn't think it robbery. Mm -hmm. So somebody to say, hey, um, you're, you're, you're uh, equal with, with God. He, one, he was God, but he recognized that the understanding was, is that, being like him doesn't replace him. That's right. It doesn't doesn't diminish him. That's right. And therefore, we saw in the scriptures where the people thought that it, from a religious standpoint, to say that you were like was in some form or fashion trying to replace. Mm -hmm. Jesus was saying, no, not only that, but you were called gods. Yes. God gave you his word. And he said that all of you are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High, Psalms 82 and 6. So now we see in the Gospels, Jesus coming demonstrating 
what it looks like for that kind of man or for man to be God like and walking in godliness as a as a son of God who's also a man who walks by faith of doing and having dominion. Now that he's demonstrated it and he's taught it, now he now challenges the disciples to do the same. And I want to show you this uh, in several different places where he is teaching them to be like him. Um, there's a scripture, I believe it's um, uh, Luke chapter six, verse number 40. It says this, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So that 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 was the objective. Jesus is training them. Now watch now watch this. Uh, in Mark chapter four, verses thirty-seven through forty-one, we find Jesus. Um, he's in a boat, and a storm arises. And what happens? The disciples get afraid, and they go to Jesus and say, "Do you care that we're going to die?" And Jesus he steps out on the bow of the ship, and he silences the storm. And they say, "What kind of man is this?" Well, it's the original kind of man. Yes. But Jesus was what? Operating as a man. We, we have to keep that in mind. He laid down his divine privilege. So the authority that he had to operate in the earth was the authority that men had. Yes. Because then it would be able to say, if, 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 if he were to do that and operate as God, then we would have no right to say, or, or Jesus tell us, that we're going to do greater works, we will say, well, how is that possible? Yeah. We can't do that. The reason why Jesus could say that is because he knew that he was operating when he did those things as a man. That's right. Who's in covenant with God. Yes. Exercising that original authority given to man. So then we see in Matthew chapter 14, verse number 25 to 29, what do we see? They're in a the storm again. But watch what Jesus says. Um, they, they cried out there in the middle of the storm. I'll, I'll just read it now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea and now they're in the middle of the storm. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I do not be afraid. Verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if that, he says, Lord, if it's you command me to come out on the water. So, so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water and went to Jesus. Now, keep this in mind. Unless Jesus had taught them that this was right. possible, why would Jesus, Why would Peter, in the middle of a storm that they were panicking in, think about getting out into the storm or walking on the water like Jesus was doing Same. unless he had taught them that you can do it too? Yes, that's right. I want, to, I want, I want you to think, why would a man think that he could do what Jesus was doing if Jesus taught them, watch me do it, but you can't do it. No, it was an expectation. He was training them in godliness. Okay. The feeding of the 5,000. We'll see the exact same thing. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verses 35 through 42. When a day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desert a deserted place and already hours late send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat but he answered and said to them you give them something to eat now wait one minute why would he now they're out in the middle of nowhere they have very little provision they came to jesus and said listen we in trouble these people have nothing to eat and we way out in the middle of nowhere watch what jesus says you give them something to eat. It's oh, it's 5,000 men if you add children and wives, if, if they got at least one child. You're talking 15,000 people. Where would, why would Jesus have the right to say to them, you give them something to eat? They have been being taught yes. to exercise God-likeness. Let's keep Let's keep reading. He says, you give them uh, something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two, uh, five and two fishes. Then he commanded them to sit down. And of course, 
he broke bread and, and multiplied it. Now watch this. Uh, if you look at John chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, this is what Jesus said. Uh, this, this is what John uh, recorded Jesus saying in that same setting. Jesus lifted up his eyes, seeing a multitude coming towards him and said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that they may eat? Here it is. But this he said to test them. For he himself knew what he was going to do. That's right. So listen. The only one, the only reason you have a test is because you've been taught. Yes. Did you hear what I said? You don't test somebody on something they have not been taught on. This is why Jesus could say from Mark's perspective, when they brought it to him, you give them something. Why? They have been being, they were taught that you don't have limitations. Your limitations is your faith. The only limitation you have is whether or not you can believe it, if you can believe God. Now, if we go to Mark chapter 8, verse number uh, 1 through 6, this is the feeding of the 4,000. Just a couple chapters later. In those days, the multitude being very great, having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and he said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way. For some of them have come from afar. Verse 4, then his disciple answered, how can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? And he, he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said seven. He commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. Again, Jesus brought to them this time. The first time they came to Jesus and said, hey, we got a problem. Jesus having already taught them two chapters earlier what to do. He recognizes a similar situation and Jesus goes to them and says, hey, fellas, we ain't got enough with these people and I don't feel like sending them home because if I send them home, they'll faint on the way. What was Jesus saying? Do y'all remember what I taught you the last time, what I showed you yeah. the last time? Do, are any of y'all going to step up and do what you've been taught? Mm -hmm. They evidently fail that test. We see in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 24, but I'm running these scriptures down quickly so that you can see a pattern where Jesus does it and then he teaches the, the disciples to do it. Uh, Matthew 4 and 23 through 24, Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the kingdom of God and healing all manner of the of sickness and all manner of diseases among the people. His fame went throughout Syria, and they brought on him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. When we look in Luke chapter 9, Jesus sends out his disciples. Now watch what we just saw in the verse where Jesus uh, preached the gospel of the kingdom. He healed all manner of sickness and disease and cast out devils. In Luke chapter 9, verse number 1 and 2, look at what Jesus sends his disciples out to do. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom and to heal the sick. So Jesus said, listen, this is what I've been doing. Now it's time for you That's right. to do it. That's right. And finally, we see in Mark chapter 11, verse number 20 through 23, we see where Jesus cursed the fig tree. And then we pick up here after Peter sees that the fig tree obeyed Jesus. Um, Jesus says, basically, why are you marveling at what you see? You can do greater. Now in the morning, starting at verse number 20, now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Verse 22, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Verse number 23, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. So Jesus says, listen, you are marveling at what I did to the fig tree. He says, if you operate the same way that I did, this mountain will, will obey you 
and cast itself into the sea. Fig tree, mountain. We see the same thing in Luke chapter 17, verse number six. The Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. Now listen to me. That type of talk, if, if, if Jesus did not expect for them to operate in that capacity, is irresponsible. It's dangerous. Unless Jesus knows what I'm teaching you to do, you can do. Yes. As a matter of fact, I'm requiring you to do it. This is a principle, and I'm going to close with this a principle with, with this principle because it is actually a burden that God, that God has given to the church that we have to embrace again. When God gives an ability, it creates a responsibility. When God gives an ability, it creates a responsibility. God's work is to give the ability. Our work is our response to that ability. That's where you get the word responsibility. When God gives an ability, there is a response ability. And this is why we see in Romans chapter 8, verse number 19, the creation is crying out for those responsible. When we look at Romans chapter 8, verse number 19, it says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Why is that? It's waiting for the sons of God to act or to walk in godliness, to act like God, because God gave man, that kind of man, sons of God, authority over the earth. They are the only one that have the ability to speak like God. Therefore, that's our responsibility to do God's work. So I'm going to stop right there. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you have been edified and encouraged in your pursuit of God's kingdom. You can find out more about J.C. Matthews Ministries by visiting us at jcmatthews.org. If you've been blessed by the message, prayerfully consider partnering with us as we take the gospel of the kingdom to all the world.